I suppose where I'm going to come from is uh, from a catch crop perspective. There's an awful lot of talk in the media at the moment surrounding catch crops, particularly with the incentive that the government has, uh, has put behind the scheme. But there are a couple of key points to bear in mind before you, you commit yourself to, uh, to growing catch crops. First of all, I would look at catch crops under, under two different headings. They're either a short-term grass, the likes of your Westerworlds or your Italian rye grasses, or probably your more commonly known catch crops, the likes of your red starts, uh, your forage rapes, your stubble turnips, and these uh, fall under brassicas. As we go through the presentation, we'll also look at forage rye as a, as a possible alternative option. This is probably more suited uh, to guys who are growing maize in rotations, but, but we, we'll also go through that. We'll also briefly look at a contract forage agreement uh, recently put together by, by Chagas. I suppose when one considers brassicas, first of all, you have to look at what exactly do I want to sow? Do I want to sow kale? Do I want to sow swedes? Do I want to sow turnips? And before, what will actually make your mind up for that is the sowing date. Realistically, it's now gone too late to sow the likes of your kale and the swedes. If you're actually considering sowing these crops, you put them in the ground in May or June. Now, fair enough, some people might have sown them back in May and June, but the likelihood is there's probably <coughs> limited amounts of these in the ground. At, at present, there is a small amount of hybrid brassica seed in the system, um, and there is still plenty of time to sow that. There is plenty of time still to sow forage rape and stubble turnip. But in terms of seed availability, uh, Philip Meany, our seed manager, will go through that during the questions and answers section later on and give us an update on, uh, on seed availability. So just going back to the topic uh, in discussion, and for this discussion, we'll, 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 more, look, we'll focus around forage rape as, uh, as one of the options. Sowing dates, soil temperatures, and seed availability are key factors here. Um, last week, soil temperatures in Oak Park were hovering between 17 to 18 degrees. That's three to four degrees ahead of where we were last year. And what that effectively has done is probably bought us an extra 10 or 12 days. So even though we're having this meeting on the 10th of August, you could actually say that it's nearly the 1st of August when we're having this discussion, purely down to a soil temperature perspective. The earlier you sow any of these crops, the greater chance you have of getting a bigger volume, the greater chance you have of getting a bigger bang for your buck. Minimum cultivations, especially if you're considering uh, grazing brassicas, that has to be a must. What that will do is that will ensure good, firm, sound underfoot conditions, um, particularly if you can imagine trying to move a strip wire in January or February. If you plough, you actually run the risk of, of probably turning the place into a bit of a, a, of a swamp in January or February. I suppose just before we go any further, and it's a, it's a question that's come up all week around these meetings, can I bail uh, forage rape? Uh, can I zero graze it? Yes, technically you can, and, and yes, it can be done. But realistically, when the time comes to do it, it's nearly impossible to actually save it into a bale or even zero graze it, purely down to the fact that the, the dry matter is just so low in it. And if you can imagine trying to bale uh, forage rape, number one, you'd have to give it a good wilt. And trying to wilt that in either November, December or January would prove next to impossible. And then trying to actually physically get it into a bale, very, very difficult also. So, you know, if I was looking at forage rape, just bear in mind that you're really committing yourself to a, to a grazing in situ situation. At present, and looking at, see, at the seed situation, forage rape is probably going to be the most widely available brassica going forward. Forage rape isn't a hybrid variety like Red Start. Red Start is a hybrid, which means, provided you don't graze it right down to the butt, it has the ability to regrow to about two thirds of its, uh, of its original growth. Um, there is red start in the ground and you know for, for those of you in the audience who have red start sown just be conscious not to graze it too much down to the butt to ensure uh, a second growth. Again site selection is going to be key in this and again it comes back to, to picturing yourself in December, January and February when you're going to be grazing. There's no point sowing uh, forage rape or red start in a heavy heavy site or in a, in a wet site. Um, Ideally, a south-facing, uh, free-draining field uh, will be key in this. Soil fertility and crop rotation. And just before I go forward onto crop rotation, pH is going to be very, very important here. Um, 6.5 to 7 is ideal. Now, if you don't have time to spread uh, ground limestone, a bag of ground lime uh, before your compound um, will suffice. In terms of soil indexes, if you're looking at a, a P and K of index 3, a couple of bags of 18, 6, 12 would be adequate. And what I'd also advise is, instead of committing all your nitrogen day one before the crop has emerged, 
just hold back a bag of nitrogen until you know what you actually have uh, before committing to, to, the, to the bag of nitrogen. Crop rotation, what I mean by that is the forage rape is a brassica and that can suffer from club root. And club root's an infection that infects all brassicas. And basically what it does is it pulls down its production by up to 40 or 50%. And that happens by growing rape crops too close to each other. The very same as oilseed rape. And, and, and you know, south tip, uh, there would be quite an amount of oilseed rape grown in this area. So if a neighbouring tillage farmer was after planting a, a forage rape crop, it's no harm to ask the question, has he grown oilseed rape in that field in the past two years? Because if he has, the likelihood is that you're going to run into serious club root issues. So just bear that in mind um, when committing to, to a brassica. This second point, and I suppose where I'm trying to come from with this is, you, d you, you don't need stubbles to sow forage rape or brassicas. They can be grown quite successfully as part of a, a reseeding plan in the farm. For example, if you had a worn out, underperforming paddock, and you know in your heart and soul, if you go spreading fertiliser, you're still going to get very, very little return from it, you potentially have a very strong opportunity to sow that with a catch crop. Now what a catch crop, like forage rape, and when I mean a catch crop in this instance, I'm referring to brassicas, that has the added benefit of reducing the leather, leather jacket um, risk, which can you know, play havoc in, in new lays by up to 70%. So what I would be advising in terms of a reseeding plan would be plant your cover crop uh, of forage rape as soon as possible, with the plan in your head that you're going to reseed this in April. That'll give you a, a great head start in terms of your leather jacket control because as we know, there's no chemistry to control leather jackets now. So this type of trick is a great cultural method of controlling uh, leather jackets. Grazing date, stock numbers and stock, and stock weights. Even though you might be allowed graze a cover crop under the new uh, department incentive scheme eight weeks after establishment, there's really no point rushing into that crop unless you have enough volume to, to graze. Now, again, if a neighbouring tillage farmer is growing the crop for you, you have to be conscious, and I suppose he equally has to be conscious of the time he wants to feel back, particularly if he's thinking of growing um, spring barley. So that's what I kind of mean by the grazing dates um, in terms of when you're going to let the cattle in and when you're going to let the cattle out. Uh, without compromising your, your, your cereal rotation, particularly if you're thinking of following uh, the brassica with spring barley. Stock numbers and stock weights. The amount you sow will depend on what type of animals you're planning on grazing these crops with. For example, if you're thinking of grazing wanelings with it, you add up your number of wanelings versus their dry matter intake to, to, get, your, to get your area which you, which you desire to sh uh, sow down. Martin and Willie will go through a couple of, of these examples in their, in their on-farm scenarios uh, in a minute. Site infrastructure, roughage, and uh, a dry lieback area. Martin's already mentioned that, but not an awful lot of tillage ground realistically is set up to, to carry livestock. Granted, dairy farmers or beef farmers who are sowing brassicas are well set up in terms of water and in terms of fencing, and even in terms of electricity, but not all tillage farmers are, so before uh, committing to growing a crop, just bear in mind that stock are going to have to have access to water and they're going to need a dry lieback area. There's no point sowing the whole field wall to wall in cover crops without sitting down and picturing yourself in January trying to either feed bales or move wires. It's no harm to leave 30 or 40 yards just as an area to, to make life that, that bit easier both on, on man and beast uh, during the feeding period. This slide, there's an awful lot of detail in this and it is, it is heavy and I am conscious of, of time so I won't go into it in too much detail but what I would say is the Glambia tillage team and the Glambia ruminant team are all well versed on this in terms of the growing of the crop and in terms of the details surrounding the crop. All of this information will also be made available on Glambia Connect but I suppose just one point is on weed control and on uh, insecticides. Realistically, you're not going to need weed control if you're, if you're considering growing forage rape, unless you're after sowing it after a hybrid winter barley crop, for example, that's after getting really, really vigorous and starting to compete with the forage rape. In that instance, yes, you do have the option to spray it with a graminicide, the likes of your, your falcons or your stratus ultras. The same type of graminicide you use in fodder beet crops, what that'll do is it'll suppress the, the volunteers, allowing the, the forage rape to, to drive on. The reason I mention an insecticide, 
is in the UK, tens upon tens of thousands of hectares of oilseed rape is lost every year to flea beetle. And this issue is actually becoming more prevalent in Ireland as the years go on. Where this is actually uh, the biggest concern is when the crop is at a cotyledon stage, just when it's emerging, and shot holes literally go through the cotyledons. And what that is, is that's the flea beetle grazing it. That flea beetle has the ability to wipe out a crop of fodder rape in probably three days. So you just have to be conscious when the crop is emerging just to keep an eye on it. Um, and I suppose just if you were thinking of sowing a, uh, a brassica into a lay, I would advise spraying off the lay beforehand just to make life that bit, uh, that bit easier for yourself. Seed isn't overly expensive. Um, and I suppose the idea of all these catch crops, they're not a long-term plan, they're a short-term plan. So try and keep the cost down as best you can. Hence why I'd, I'd be recommending um, you know, minimum tillage uh, uh, where possible. Again, the, the crop nutrition will all depend on your soil indexes. But treat the, the forage crop or the brassica crop like you would any crop, you know? Feed it and it will, uh, it will deliver for you. This is, there's going to be bits of this overlapping with the forage rape, so I'll just touch on the key points. If a neighbouring tillage farmer, for example, came to a dairy farmer or a beef farmer and he's a member of Gloss and he said, would, would you like the grazing of the Gloss uh, cover crop? The one question you need to ask is what actual cover crop have you planted? Because there's 10, 12, 13 different species you can plant under Gloss. The option which a, which a feeder, which a beef farmer or a dairy farmer would be looking at would be the likes of the forage rape and the leafy turnip. Um, those species are available under glass and you have to sow two crops by law. What I would be suggesting is, yes, yeah, sow the minimum amount of forage rape, which is 1.2 kilos to the acre and 2 kilos of leafy turnip, but add another 2 kilos of forage rape. It's not that expensive and it's in your benefit in the long run from a feeding perspective. Again, sowing dates, field history and rotations are critical here, particularly if that farmer who's growing the glass cover crop has a history of growing leafy turnip and forage rape for the past three years, more than likely he's going to be in serious uh, problems with club root and it's a no benefit for you to get the grazing off that crop um, if you know that he's after growing forage rape there for the past three years and it's no harm to be aware of that uh, going forward. <coughs> cover crop needs to be treated as a forage crop. In other words, there's no point just firing in the cover crop to draw a payment down. If you want this crop to deliver grazing, you need to treat it for what it is, which is a, fo a forage crop. Again, this first point is just to reiterate the point of sowing extra rape, particularly if you're considering it as a, as a, graz as a grazing option. Under glass, you cannot, uh, by law, plough to establish a cover crop. It has to be established under uh, a minimum uh, cultivation technique. Now that again has a great benefit of ensuring firm underfoot conditions. I was talking to a guy in Wexford last night and he was saying that he's after establishing a crop of forage rape and it's like concrete underneath it. And he was worried and I said that's going to be the, the best thing that could happen to him in December or January because he's not going to plough that place into muck. So that's a, that is a positive. At present, and this is up for renewal at the moment and we hope to have confirmation on this, cover crops grown under glass cannot be grazed under December until December 1st, apologies. Under the new government scheme recently announced, you're allowed graze the crop eight weeks after establishment. Now the difference between glass, as Martin alluded to, and the new scheme under, uh, announced under the government is that the new government scheme, you have to sow the crop between the 3rd of August and the 15th of September. Any forage crop sown at either side of those dates aren't going to qualify for the the 100 euro hectare brassica payment or the 150 euro hectare short term grass payment. So just bear that in mind. And also under that scheme, as I've already said, you're allowed to graze that crop eight weeks after it's established. But presently under glass, you're not allowed to touch it until December 1st, but the likelihood is that that date will be brought forward. Again, grazing dates, infrastructure, stock number and stock weights are, are key. And just to reiterate the point, that's especially important if the cover crop is grown on a neighbouring tillage farmer's land. Realistically, you know, the tillage farmer who's growing glass cover crops, and the reason I mention tillage farmers is most farmers who are growing glass cover crops are tillage farmers, and they're generally following that crop by spring barley. They're going to want to have that land back in barley in either the end of February or at least at the very latest St. Patrick's Day. So just bear that in mind if you're, if you're getting involved um, with a tillage farmer in the grazing of a glass forage crop. 
I'm not going to go into too much uh, detail in this, uh, again, purely from a, from a time perspective, but just to reiterate the point, and I don't know, have I mentioned it earlier or not, but potash and sulfur are, uh, are key factors in the growing of, uh, of brassicas. If you're spreading a compound uh, when establishing either forage rape, um, a cover crop mix like, like forage rape or leafy turnip or red start, just bear in mind that the compound ideally should have sulfur. Again, what I would advise is when the crop is after uh, striking, top dress afterwards just to ensure that, that, that you have a crop which is, which is worth driving on. Westerworlds, I suppose this is probably the most talked about grass over the past two or three weeks and people can't seem to see beyond it. Um, what Westerworlds is, it's an extremely annual vigorous plant. You can't lose uh, sight of that word vigorous. If this crop goes to seed, and I'll go into it in a little bit more detail shortly, it has, uh, it has the ability to actually play havoc with following reseeds or following cereal crops. Westerworlds, unlike Italian ryegrass, is more short term. Italian ryegrass has the ability to, uh, to keep producing for two to three years. Now what other people might know Italian ryegrass is as RVP, but that was just a, just a brand name. Um, so again, just be aware of the differences between Westerworlds and Italian ryegrass. You can expect two to three cuts of Westerworlds, provided you sow early. And when I mean early, I'm talking about sowing in the next two weeks, two to three weeks. Um, time is of the essence in catch crops, so you know, there's no point um, you know, thinking about it for too long. You're either going to commit and go with it now, and the earlier you can, uh, the better it'll deliver for you. So again, I'd probably be looking at a first cut in either November, uh, end of November possibly, going out then with a bag of urea or a bag of 29-0-14, protected urea in January. What that'll do is that'll drive an earlier second cut, and then again it'll drive an earlier third cut. So the earlier you can get at Westerworlds, um, the better. Well suited to zero grazing also. Now, where that probably comes into its own is if, if guys are thinking of milking on late into the winter, they do have the option of Westerworlds coming on with the option of zero grazing uh, back to the yard. So they are flexible from that perspective. Where I wouldn't uh, use Westerworlds, and I suppose now is, a, now is the time to mention it, I probably wouldn't use Westerworlds in a cereal rotation, particularly if I was following it with, with uh, spring barley or spring, white or spring wheat. Purely down to the fact that for you to get the benefit out of Westerworlds, you need to ideally leave them there till April. And by taking the Westerworlds out early, you're actually doing the, doing the Westerworlds disservice. Alternatively, you could shove the date of, of the spring barley back, but again, you're only doing yourself disservice there again. So really keep the Westerworlds out of a cereal rotation. I'd also keep it out of a reseeding plan um, for that matter. Just in case it does go to seed, it's going to be very, very difficult to remove out of a new lay. So where Westerworlds would probably fit best is if someone is thinking of uh, following it with beet or following it with maize. Now, there's no problem sowing Westerworlds if you want to take it out early and don't let it go to seed. So don't think I'm, I'm completely shooting it down in cereal or grass rotations. But just bear in mind that the longer you can leave it in, provided it doesn't go to seed, the bigger benefit you can, uh, you can get out of it. Um, field history, reseeding and rotations are important considerations. I've already touched on that, I suppose, throughout. Do not let go to seed. Now, I've mentioned this point, and I cannot reiterate that enough. The same goes for Italian ryegrass. Ideally, if you're considering sowing Italian ryegrass or West Orals, what I would advise is to leave one meter around the ditch unsown, uh, leave one meter around trees or areas which the mower or the zero grazer can't get. And I suppose an easy way to remember is only sow what you can mow. Anything that you leave behind with a zero grazer, um, with a mower or a baler, that will ultimately go to seed and that will spread like hell throughout the field and you will have a bloody mess down the line. So do not let these go to seed, and that is a key point in this. It's an ideal catch crop uh, for maize rotations, simply down to the fact that you can sow Westerworlds right on until the 15th of October. You're going to get the added benefit of letting them run until April because you're probably not going to be putting in the maize until the middle of April anyway. So they do fit well um, if someone is considering double cropping their, their ground as a way of building up stocks. Again, fertilize adequately. And that goes for all catch crops. In terms of Westerworlds, I'd probably encourage a bag of urea or a bag of 29-0-14 in January just to drive, uh, drive production. 
Italian ryegrass offers more flexibility and I suppose what I mean by that is if you're thinking of putting in a, a short-term grass as a way of building stocks but you don't want to, to commit to taking it out next April, Italian ryegrass is a better option because it does offer the opportunity to get probably an extra three or four cuts over the, over the following 16, 17 months. So just think about it logically before you put, uh, you put, you put any short-term grass in. Again, this is just a little bit of detail um, which we go into surrounding uh, the growing of the grasses, but due to time constraints, I'm not going to, to, going to go into this in too much detail, but I'm happy to, to talk to anyone on a one-to-one -one basis afterwards. <laughs> uh, forage rye. Now, I suppose when I, when I mentioned catch crops, forage rye wouldn't have been a crop which, which would have come to an awful lot of people's, uh, I suppose, attention. And what it is, is it's effectively a cereal which can be grown as a bray crop uh, as a way of building up forage stocks. You can plant it either before a cereal, maize or fodder beet. Um, what I mean by that is the sowing date of forage rye is September uh, stroke October. That's the ideal time to sow it. So as you know, with brassicas and with your, your Westerworlds, yes we are under time constraints to get these crops in. Not at all with forage rye, we have plenty of time to get this in. But where this really comes into its own is, uh, is in a maize rotation. You know, and if you think about it logically, I'm growing maize and I'm not going to get a cut until probably the end of September or October. I'm still going to be under pressure for grass going forward and I don't really know what to do and I, don't, I can't afford to take land out of production. Forage rye is an absolute gem of an option in that situation. You can mow it, you can zero graze it, you can strip graze it. Um, very, very versatile. You leave it there until again the end of March, April, just before you sow the maize crop. So again, it's a great way of uh, of double cropping your ground. <coughs> Minimum tillage is advisable with all of these options, particularly if you want to get stock on ground. But realistically, if you want to try and get a crop of forage rye in after maize in October, more than likely you're going to have to plough. And that's not the end of the world, particularly if you want to, to bale or, uh, or zero graze the crop out of it afterwards. Yes, it can be mixed with Italian ryegrass as a way of, uh, I suppose, once the, once the rye goes, that you do have new covers coming on. But the one point I would make on that is the Italian ryegrass is going to dictate the harvesting date of the forage rye purely down to the, the heading ability of the Italian ryegrass. So just bear that in mind. Anytime you're looking at Italian ryegrass, bear in mind not letting this go to seed. As I already said, it's well suited to zero grazing and it can be strip grazed uh, or baled. Don't allow it go into the winter too strong. What I mean by that is forage rye, like winter barley, needs to have the ability to tiller. And by putting a uh, light stock in it in December just to give it a light graze, that will actually encourage tillering and it will drive it on again in the spring. So just bear that in mind if you're, if you're looking at forage rye. The crop needs the tiller and it will need a light graze and not uh, go into the, the following spring too strong. Look at it's not as vigorous at all as, uh, as Italian ryegrass um, or Westerworlds, but just out of, I suppose, um, good field hygiene. I wouldn't allow any of these go to seed either because you're only making hassle for yourself down the line. I suppose the one big elephant in the room when you look at forage rye right, compared to your, your forage rape is the seed costs. It's about 90 quid an acre more in seed, but where it will come into its own is, uh, is on the dry matter yield. It, it has the potential to deliver two and a half tonne of dry matter to the acre. It's not for everyone, but you have to look at it in the overall context of its ability to double crop ground and as a way of, uh, of building up forage stocks uh, within the yard. This is just a brief slide on, on, on the feeding values of all the different fodder crops. As I've already mentioned, you can just look at the fresh weight and even the bales per acre off forage rye versus Westerworlds. You know, and that even has the ability to probably go to 13 or 14 bales provided <coughs> it gets enough of a kick. But you know, due to, I'm not going to go into this in too much detail and, and Martin and, and Willie are going to touch on some of this in the next presentation. This is a production agreement uh, put together by Chagas. Now most farmers, to be fair on us, we, you know, we have a great ability to, to form agreements with our neighbours, particularly in years like this. And to be fair, tillage farmers recognise the need on the ground and they are willing to grow crops for, for their neighbours. But what this agreement does is it just puts a bit more confidence, um, a bit more structure, uh, a bit more clarity around the whole arrangement, particularly if the farmer uh, who's growing the crop for you wants the land back by a certain date. It just avoids any, um, you know, any rows down the line and just adds a bit more structure to the whole thing. 
I suppose this slide is just a summary and if there was any key messages I would, I would encourage anyone to take home when they're looking at catch crops is you need to plan early, plant early. By doing this you, you'll deliver earlier grazing which will deliver an earlier harvesting date which will ultimately give you an earlier reseeding or earlier second cuts of Westworlds or Italians and the same goes for, for getting um, a following cereal crop in. So look at it goes, you know, it echoes Martin's point, it echoes Shane's point. It's all about making a plan. We have two to three weeks now to, to really be serious about getting catch crops in the ground. In the ground. So the earlier we can make a plan, um, you know, the benefit it is, it, it goes the whole, way, uh, the whole way down the chain. And I suppose this is just the final slide just to, I suppose, just to emphasise the point that, you know, Glambia have a dedicated uh, tillage team and they have a dedicated ruminant team who are well versed on these topics. Um, catch crops are new to an awful lot of dairy farmers, an awful lot of beef farmers and even tillage farmers. <coughs> and don't be a bit afraid to pick up the phone and, uh, and look for advice in it. Um, everyone's aware of, of the situation we're in surrounding fodder deficits. And yes, catch crops do have the, the opportunity uh, to, to, to help in this, but just don't be afraid to, to ask uh, ask any of your Glambia representative on information, um, you know, just to get the key points right in it.